My last couple jobs that I've had, I've been able to travel um, the country uh, extensively. I've been able to do uh, travel coast to coast in many states, and um, uh, and and many times my my wife will tell me she's like, uh, I want to go there, and I'm like, I've already been there, and she's like, no, well, that's not fair. I want to go to the like the Northwest, and I've already been there, and I've seen you know the the, the neat things that are there, and I've got to experience some pretty cool. Uh, Pretty cool things, uh, you know. I've seen the Grand Canyon from a plane. Um, you know, I guess you can you can see it uh, face to face. Uh, I've got to you know to travel uh, the country. But one thing that I did get to travel is uh, in in southern, uh, actually mid uh, California. I traveled out there and uh, went to the uh, Sequoia National Forest. Um, how many have been to the Sequoia National Forest? Okay, good. Sequoia National Forest, somebody, uh, we flew into a farm show in Tulare, and uh, uh, we actually flew into Fresno and went to Tulare, and, and uh, we were in Tulare, and, and I asked the person at the front desk, they said, uh, um, you know, do you, I said, you know, what, what's there to do around here that's interesting? And usually that's what I do when I check into a hotel, if I'm going to be there for a week and I have days to kill or, or evenings, or whatever, and they said, well, you got to go see Ger General Sherman, and I'm like, is he embalmed somewhere, or what, what's the deal here? And she's no General General Sherman, the tree. And I'm like, okay, it's a tree. I'm like, I I, I don't know quite. You know, she's like, this is the largest tree that in the world. And I was like, okay, now you have my interest. Um, so we took a a, a, we, a couple of guys, and, and I uh, I took the trip, and it's a windy road. If you've ever been there, um, you know a road is windy when they have pull-off points for you to basically recalibrate yourself because it's so many switchbacks and you pull off to the side and you get out and you breathe for a while and you kind of get your motion sickness in control and you go back up and you just keep winding up through this Sequoia National Forest and it's a beautiful place if you ever get uh, in the area or around if you ever get around the Fresno area I would highly recommend you go see it it's it's something that's amazing but General General Sherman is the largest. Uh, they, they call it. Some people call it the largest tree by volume. Some people say it's the largest living organism. There's a, there's all kinds of uh, titles that they give it. But I will just tell you this much: it's big. Okay, it's it's huge. I'll give you some numbers here for you. It's 275 feet tall. So it's as tall as, or, or, or is getting taller than the Statue of Liberty at this point, uh, from the from the base level all the way up to the point. Um, it is 36, in, in, 36 feet in diameter. Think about that, diameter. And then this is the one that really blows my mind is the circumference of it is 102 feet. You just, you just, just, this is a massive, and I literally, when I showed up, I was like, wow, that's a big tree. Okay, I mean, it's, it's huge. It's, it's, it's this massive trunk on this thing, uh, and, and, it, and it is something that, that is, uh, you see it and, it, it, and you just stand in awe of it. And then you immediately try to walk around it. At that time, we could still walk around it, you kind of outside, they have a fence set up around it. Um, it's amazing. They talk about the, I call it the fur or the bark of the tree. Um, is actually fire repellent. That's why it actually has survived all these years. Um, it's actually pretty interesting. So if you're ever there, go see it. Now, even in saying that to you, your mind, some of you are pretty good with dimensions. 275 feet tall. Okay, what is that? That's about 27 stories. 36 feet in diameter. Okay, that's a center to the outside. Okay, 36 feet. And you start trying to look for comparisons. And then you, you get a circumference of 102 feet. And you get kind of, okay. And then you start thinking about But you can't actually picture it or actually experience it, I should say, until you actually go and see it. Uh, they show pictures of people standing in front of them. And they look like miniature dolls in, 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 front, of this, in front of this massive tree. But it's interesting, in, in, in Psalm here, you have David who is talking about the Lord. And he's talking about God. And he's talking about what the Lord means to him. And there's a lot of times in our life, I, I, I know I'm talking to a Sunday night crowd. And this is, a, this is the crowd that, that normally you guys have, have, are dedicated to what it is that we do. Uh, you guys are dedicated to church. You're dedicated to, uh, to the Lord's ministry. And I understand that. I grew up in a Christian home all my life. I have good parents. Hi, Mom and Dad. Okay, they're, they're here today. i got to say that because they're in the building. Um, but understand that I, I grew up in a good Christian home. But I understand, but I, I, the knowledge that they gave me about God was great. But until I experienced it for myself, 
It was nothing more than knowledge. Now, I, I, I challenged the kids on, on Wednesday night when we were talking through this. I have no doubt teens of this youth group know God, know who God is. They know about the Bible. They, they, if you ask them a question about the Bible, they will be able to tell you the right answer. But do you actually know God? Is he personal with you? Is he, is he, is he, is he, is he, does he have a personal impact on your life? Well, David here is writing, and it's very interesting how David writes, and I, I love uh, the way that David writes. He opens his heart and his mind to us, allows us to kind of see into his thinking here. But in, in, in Psalm 91, he starts talking about, or he, he, he starts a song or a psalm uh, about, uh, about God and his might and his almightiness. We're just going to read through the first couple verses here, but understand that the whole passage is directed in this way. But in verse number one, it says this, He that dealeth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings thou shalt trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror of night, nor the, uh, the arrow that flieth by day, nor the pestilence that walketh in the darkness, nor the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh to thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Now the verse that I want to focus in on is verse number two. It says this, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress and my God, in him will I trust. My challenge for you tonight, and, and, and if I was to put a title on this message, would be this, who... And what is the Lord to you? And the first part of, of, of verse 2 here, it, David says, I will say of the Lord. This is an absolute personal thing. This is not a, the, yes, the Bible can be uh, studied in, in, in a corporate setting. This would be a corporate setting. You can study with a group of people. You can study with, your, if, you're, if you're married, with your spouse. And, and you can have that, that, that moment but ultimately, your relationship with God is a personal choice. I love the words that he uses here. This, if we get back into school, I used to teach grammar and composition, if you can believe that, for junior high kids. And personal pronouns. Everybody's like, all the moms in here that teach are like, no! <laughs> personal pronouns. Why are they personal? What? Because they show possession, right? Right? Good. Good job, Care. You did a good job teaching them. Understand this. A personal pronoun is a personal thing, meaning it, it, it adds a person to that, that, that sentence. So when, when David says here, I will say of the Lord, instead of saying I, I want you to cross out your name there, and I want you to, not in the Bible, but in your thought process for tonight, I want you to write your name in there. That's the focus that we need to have here as far as for tonight. David says, this is, I will say of the Lord, meaning this is my thoughts. I choose to do this. This is not the priest. This is not the law. This is not the Bible. This is not uh, what somebody taught me. This is me saying, I will say. Sometimes we hide behind the fact of the weakness of our relationship with God with the goodness that God has put around us, if you can understand what I'm saying here. You come to a good church, and automatically you associate that, that you, go, you have a good relationship with God. Your spouse may be walking with the Lord closely, so you in turn to almost take credit for it, and the idea of, well, if they're walking with God, I must be. You run around with good friends and good people, and you may go to even Bible studies, but it never breaks through to the personal. 
The idea here, when David says, I will say of the Lord, it's, this is something that is deeply personal to him. This is a decision that he has made. This is a choice that he has, say, has, has made in his life that he is going to say this of the Lord. My question to you is, what would you say the Lord is to you tonight? The first thing David says is, he is my refuge. He is my refuge when you think of refuge, you think of a safe place, you think of, uh, of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, a comforting place, you think of a, uh, a place that's out, outside of um, uh, the difficulties of this world, a place to run to, a place to rest, a place to relax. Uh, this is what refuge is. Now, guys, uh, families here, people here, we're living in a crazy world that is filled with hostilities and filled with frustrations, filled with anxieties, filled with, with difficulties, filled with challenges, filled with persecutions. And if you don't have a place of refuge, unfortunately, you never get out of the battle. And I've coached enough basketball to understand that if, if you leave your best players in the game all game long and you never give them a break, you know what happens in the fourth quarter? It's not good. Legs get tired, shots get missed, passes get, get, get thrown out of bounds, and, and, and what happens? You lose the game. If you don't have a place of refuge, you never get out of the battle. You never, you never have an opportunity to step back and allow the Lord to work. The Lord is our refuge. The difficulties that you're facing with your family, the difficulties that you're facing with, your, with work, the difficulty you're facing uh, in your personal lives, whatever that might be, God is that refuge. My question is, are you using him? See, we say it, and it sounds great. God's my refuge. Yep, got it, Adam. Mr. You got, check it. Check the box. I, I, I know that. God is our But do you access it? Okay, so let, let's just use this, an example here. I used this with the teens earlier today. We had the derecho come, or the, the tornadoes come through here and uh, just down the road here. If you were standing out in the parking lot and it started to hail, and hail, you know, a little sleet hits you in the face and you're kind of like, ooh, that kind of stinks. Now you get hit with a hailstone. It's going to leave a mark. And you have a choice. You can try to dodge hailstones out in the parking lot or you can simply step underneath the carport. Which one are you going to choose? Now, unfortunately, all of us, not all of us, some of us are sitting there looking at the carport and saying, hey, that carport, yeah, that, yeah, that, that, that's safety right there. I, I could go underneath that, sure. I could, I could go underneath that, and, and what are you doing the whole time? Dodging, you're trying to dodge hailstones. And what ends up happening? Every now and then you get plunked in the head. Now, has the refuge changed? No. It's still there. What has, what has changed? You. It's our change that needs to happen. It's an inter this is an internal choice. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. Now, again, what did you see in there? Anybody catch the, 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 uh, the other personal pronoun there? My refuge. Mine. My, my, mine. Right? Come close? Okay, good. Still kind of remembers you know, almost 20 years ago. Uh, but understand this, it, it's, it's, it's there. It's mine. My personal refuge. This is something that is personal to me. This is something that I access. God should be more to us than just a help. He should, just, he be, he should be more to us than just a fact. He should be more to us than just knowledge. He should actually be our refuge from this world. Our refuge from our frustrations, our refuge from the difficulties that we face. And the interesting thing about it is once you access that refuge, you know what you find out? You really enjoy it. You need that break. You need that opportunity to, to allow the Lord to work. You need the opportunity to allow your mind to shut off. Now, uh, Carrie's uh, downstairs with the kids so I can say whatever I want right now so this is great without her looking at me um, so when we go on vacation her idea of vacation and my idea of vacation are two separate things okay? 
My idea of vacation is this. Give me a beach somewhere, give me a lake, give me anything that, that with, with nature like that. Give me a chair, give me a book, give me a radio, give me something, give me, and that's it. I'll, that's all I need. I'll check out for, for a couple days and, and allow my mind to relax. I love the family being there, and we'll go and play games and stuff, but I, I, I really, I don't want to do anything. Now, that would make Carrie's skin crawl. Okay, she is more of a doer. She likes to go for a couple days, and then she's like, all right, we got to start doing, doing stuff. Because she's just that type, we're a different type of people. Now, I, my vacation, I come home from my vacation, and guess what I am? Relaxed. I've not done anything, and I come back. And, now, I go on her vacations, and we're relaxed, but what do, what do we also have done? I need a vacation from the... Vacation, okay? So, so then, it, that, it, how many times have you heard that? Now, I love, I love both. I will tell you this much. I love doing things with my family. I, Carrie has, has, uh, has planned some cool things for us, and, and, the, and, and the kids have got to experience all of those. Now, this is talking about the idea, when we, we coming back to the passage here, this is a place where once you start accessing it, you know what you find out? When you come back into the world and another battle comes up, you're more ready for the attack. You're more ready for what it is that, that, that is coming down the pike. And the next thing that God says here, or, or David says here, and, and he uses a, a conjunctive word, and we're using a lot of English this morning, I, uh, evening, I apologize, but it's a connection word, and it says, uh, he is my refuge and, which is a conjunction, my fortress. So not only is he a safe place, not only is he a peaceful place, not only is he a quiet place, but now he is my fortress. Now you think about this. Not only is he our refuge, but he is our protection. God is our strength in the time of need. Something that, that I have enjoyed doing uh, over the years has been to go around to historical places, and we've gone to a couple of forts, and, uh, and, and you see these massive forts that have been built in the U.S., and these forts are there as protection. What's interesting about these forts is they protect regardless of who is in them. And the person that goes in them doesn't really have to do anything other than go inside the fort. And when you start thinking about what David is actually talking about, he is talking about not only is God my refuge, my safe place, my quiet place, all of the, 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 the comforts that he needs, but he's also talking about when I go, when I access God... He is my fortress, and he fights my battles for me. Craig talked about that this morning, and the idea of, 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 of allowing the Lord to work in your life and allow him to battle for you. The idea of a, of a fortress is that once we access him, his defense is there for us to access. And he is the one that protects us. He is the one that directs us. He is the one that challenges the enemy. The next part of this verse is probably the most important. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. Two words. Another personal pronoun. My God. Is he your God? Is he? Really think about this, because this is th these two words here I thought about for a long time these last couple weeks. My God. If he's my God, then I need to act like he is my God. There are lots of, of gods in this world to follow. There, there, there's the, the God of money, there's the God of success, there's the God of passions, there's the God of desires, there's, the, there's other religions in this world. But when David claims that God is his, my God, what does he say? What is he saying? He's recognizing that God is who he needs. He is everything to him. And to recognize this is to recognize that God is a greater, greater than you. To recognize that God is who, who God is is to recognize that you are less than him. That means that something out there is more powerful than you. Now, you think this is not a big deal, but this is huge in society today. If we do not recognize that there is a God and that he is more powerful than us, then we ourselves become God, or God's lowercase g, just to be careful here. 
And if we do that, then guess what? We get to choose. And if we get to choose, then we get to choose what's right. We get to choose what's wrong. We get to choose whatever it is that people are choosing these days. And it doesn't take long when you read in, in, in any article that, that is out there today of all the choosing that is going on in this world. And why is that? People always, always ask that. Why is that? Why is there so much frustration now? I, I can tell you why. Teaching all those years ago, I, I learned one thing. One of the many things I've learned. Back in the 1970s and 1980s, something happened in, in textbooks across the country. And what was that? That was one big thing. It's, it's a word keyed as science. And the word is evolution. And that started back in the 70s and 80s. And once you found out that evolution, evolution in, infiltrated textbooks across the country, and especially in public schools, what did you find out? By taking evolution and taking God out of, out of the world or out of the textbooks, you know what you find out? God doesn't exist. Or at least that's what they say. Oh, it's all by happenstance. It's all by chance. And then you have Christians that have bought into partial evolution or spatial evolution or time evolution. And you know what you find out? By doing that, they diminish the power of who God is. And then what happens? Today happens. Society today is exactly what happened 20 or 30 years ago and a result of what happened 20 or 30 years ago. See, the two words there, my God, is the identification that there is something greater than me. And by recognizing that there is something greater than me, that, rec that, that, there, that means that I must recognize who that is. I, am, I need to understand what that is. I need to understand how to access this. What is God and what do you understand? Well, what you, what you find out is this. When I find out about God here, and when I find out about God here, it's all good. That's what our Sunday schools are for. That's what sometimes even preaching behind here is for. But when I actually find out what God is in here and actually take it to my life, you know what's interesting, what's really funny? I was talking to Connor Buchanan about this the other day. We were talking about selling. And we were talking about selling and we were talking about uh, different things. I had. With my job, I'm in sales. And there, there's, a, there's an adage that you never want to sell under pressure because you change, you change what, it changes how you sell, your comfortability. I said, you know, being a Christian and selling is probably the easiest thing in the world because God ultimately is in control of it. So if I'm selling something or if I'm, I'm trying to sell something, if I get it, great, God be praised. If I don't get it, great, God be praised. Now, what's interesting in the, in, in, in the passage here, when, when David says, my God, he's saying, he's saying that God's in control of everything. And you know, when God is in control of everything, even the bad things, God is still working. Even in the challenges, God is still working. Even in the goodness, God is still working. Even in the persecution, God is still working. And you know what you get to see? God. And when David says here, my God, he's talking about my completeness. This is, a, this is something that we as Christians need to hold on to. It's one thing to know it. It's another thing to believe it in your own personal life. When David says here, my God, this is a personal thing. In the last part of the, phrase, uh, the verse here, it says, in him will I trust. Well, he's identified who God is. He says, he is my refuge, he is my fortress, he is my God, in him will I trust. Meaning that he's given his, 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 uh, his justification, and now he's giving his absolute. Is God worthy to be trusted? I would dare tell you, ask you, what, is God willing, or, or, or is God worthy to be trusted? And I would say to you, why not? Why would you not trust him? A person that places their complete trust in God is, is the idea that they are placing their complete confidence, their complete life in, 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 this, uh, in God. Trust, ultimately, is a choice. This is the part that, that 
is really kind of eye-opening when you walk through the Christian life. When you figure out that all of this head knowledge, which is really good, this becomes a choice because we find out, okay, this is, this is here and the world is here. And I have a choice to make. Which one do I believe in? And, when am, and how am I going to apply that? Which one am I going to trust in? Trust, ultimately, is a, tr- is a choice. Do you trust in God? Not do you know that there is a God, but do you trust in God? I, I've used this example before, and, and forgive me and just go through it, um, but this is probably the best example of trust that I, I've seen in my own personal life. When I used to travel when I was a kid, <clears throat> okay, we used to travel in a, a, it was a Dodge window van with vinyl seats. It's a gray van, had gray interior, light blue, gray interior seats, vinyl seats. Um, and we used to, it, the, my dad used to tell us we had air conditioning. We had 685 air conditioning, or 6, 685? No, 658 air conditioning, or 865 air I can't remember what the number was. But what that meant was all the windows in the, in the van were open, and he was driving 65 miles an hour. So that, that was air conditioning. Uh, the, 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 side of the, the side windows only opened that far, and I can remember as a kid resting my head there, you know, like a dog trying to get the air to just come in, just to cool me off just a little bit. Uh, we took that trip down to Florida um, in the middle of July, which was, uh, which was fun. Uh, I can remember, uh, uh, it was a great trip, by the way, a lot of fun. Uh, I can remember my legs always sticking to the vinyl. How many remember your legs sticking to vinyl? And you, you get up and it just makes that, and you're like, did I leave a piece of me behind? <laughs> a lot, and there were lots of memories in that van. The kids nowadays traveling, we used to travel, mom used to do uh, all kinds of games, and we'd have uh, you know, coloring books. I remember when we were real little, and we used to play the license plate game and the alphabet game and, the, and, the, and all kinds of games. Uh, Mom's favorite game was always the quiet game. Um, I don't know why that was always the favorite, but that, you know. But now kids travel, uh, it, it's completely different. I mean, I look in the back. I, we were driving out to New Hampshire. This was back when Ella was, uh, was probably two or three. And she, she was probably four years old. We had, she had a car seat. The car seat had a recline in it. I've never, I mean, it literally had a recline feature in it with cup holders. And, I, I, and I'm like, okay, this is, we may have crossed a threshold that we can't go back. And as we're, we're hurtling down the road at, at, you know, at 70, 80 miles an hour, I, I, I happen to glance up in my rear view mirror and see Ella. And she's completely reclined. She's got her leg crossed over the other one. And she's got uh, an iPad or, or, or a phone or, or whatever it was. And she's got earphones on. And she's, got, and, and she's watching a DVD while doing something else. And, oh, all the time they're controlling their temperature in the back of the van to make it colder because they didn't like the temperature that my wife and I had it up front. Now, the interesting about it was we were all traveling 70 miles an hour down the road. Do you know what she was not worried about? She was not worried about potholes. She was not worried about bridges. She was not worried about uh, you know, uh, what, you know, what was happening in front of us with traffic. She wasn't worried about uh, what time we were going to get there. What was she worried about? <laughs> yeah. What, what, I hope this thing's get, still got power. That's basically what she, she's like, can I get a recharge here? She was worried about when are we going to eat and when do I need to use the restroom? That was really about all she was worried about. And I looked in the back and I thought about that for a moment, about life and about the picture of life and trust in God. Now, we were all going the same speed. We were all going the same direction. We were all going to ultimately get to the same destination. But she had a choice. Now, she could have been in the back going, hey, Dad, uh, watch out. There's a car coming up. Dad, seriously, there's there's a bridge and it's a river and I don't know if we're going to make it. I don't know if you can do it, okay? And she could just, Dad, did you, did, did you hear that, that engine sound? It kind of sounded a little off. Dad, what was that thumping sound? Was that a flat tire? Now, that's what all dads in here when you're driving, that's what we listen for. Everybody else is asleep in the car having a great time. We're, we're listening to all that stuff. Now, she could have done that. And what would, she have, what would she have experienced? She would have experienced being a dad on a road trip. That's what she would have experienced. But instead, what did she experience? being a kid, completely trusting in me, 
completely relaxed and seeing where we were going to go. Literally, the only thing she knew is she got in the car in Iowa, she got out of the car at Nanny and Grap's house in New Hampshire. That's what she knew. Now, when the Lord said, when David says here, trust, it's not the idea of complacency. Don't get, don't, don't get tied up with the illustration on that. And it's not the idea of lackadaisical effort. We still move and we still do things with, with, in our life that we need to do. You need to go to work. You need to work hard for your family. You need to be a part of the church. You need to be in ministry. You need to be moving yourself. But the idea that I want you to focus on is the idea of trust in the Lord. Complete confidence in him. Craig talked about it this morning, the idea of putting your, your family, your, your work, your business, your, your life in, in God's hands, your children in God's hands. This is the idea of our trust. Do we trust God? Completely. I don't care that you can say it out of your mouth. That's great if you can. God wants to see it in here. And ultimately, that's what we should be doing. We should be trusting. We should be caring. We should be seeing what God is to us. Our goal as a Christian should always be to have a closer walk with the Lord. One that continues to rely less on us and our abilities and more on our Heavenly Father. My question to you tonight is very simple. Who or what is God to you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, again, do thank you for tonight.